Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. And so I've been thinking a lot about fear and how the disciples were using their fear to justify certain ways of living out the kingdom. And I'm thinking today about the way we use our fear as justification to live out the kingdom in particular ways. Fear is a defensive response to a threat. It's self-preservation. It's survival instinct. Sin is essentially self-obsession. If fear is a self-preservation response to a threat, and sin is self-obsession. How closely related are the two? Both fear and sin firmly fix our eyes on ourselves. And for this reason, the Bible is dubious about fear. Now, the Bible doesn't say we can't be afraid. But it's very concerned with what we do with our fear. And so the question here is not, I, I, at least the point here I don't think is that Jesus calls the disciples fears illegitimate, but he tries to help them to understand what they have to do in light of what is happening. We've talked about these four realities of the kingdom over the course of this series. The first is that God does not centralize power, but that he, he keeps the authority to distribute the ministry in himself. He doesn't give that authority to the disciples. That's important. So the first sermon was God distributes the ministry. The second was that God determines the message. That the disciples did not have a choice as to what they were to teach these folks who were coming to them to follow Jesus. He tasked them with teaching what he had told them and the example that he had lived. They were to keep the story of Jesus before the people. They had no choice in that. That was the second sermon. God determines the message. And last week we talked about the fact that God told them that they would be subject to judgment and punishment in this world. That he was not going to keep them safe from the things that would assault them. That's the whole lopping off of arms and gouging out of eyes, which is the way Romans treated crimes in their world. And so he tells them that they will suffer. And through that suffering they will be kept last. They will remain humble. And then today... We're going to talk about this whole deal with salt and peace. And what I want to say is, God is the one who delineates the nature of our relationships with others. Look back at the chapter there, chapter 9, verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Now, I want to just say one thing to kind of get it off the table. I know there are scientists out there who think, I'm going to test this. I'm going to see how long it takes the salt in my salt shaker to become not salty. Good luck with that. It'll never happen. Right? Salt, purified salt the way we have in those little containers, they never lose their saltiness. So what is Jesus talking about? How can salt lose its saltiness? Well, just remember, and I'm just saying this to take it out of your mind. Salt in the ancient world was not nearly as pure as what we have. It wasn't pure uh, sodium chloride, if I've got the chemical compound right. 
but it was mixed with other impurities. And so it was not uncommon in the ancient world for the salt component to leach out and to be left with nothing but the impurities. And that's how salt loses its saltiness in the ancient world. Same can happen with rock salt today, uh, if you leave it on the road long enough. So just get that out of your mind. But the salt is an important metaphor in the scriptures, especially here. And it, Jesus gives us an indication of what he's aiming at, because he's talked about suffering, and the suffering is like fire, and all will be salted with fire. And so we talked about that last week, that God has promised that he is not going to protect those who follow Jesus from suffering. He's promised that. But the salted with fire issue is bigger than that, because this brings us back to the covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai and the sacrifices they were to make. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Leviticus. Just turn to chapter 1. I'm not going to read it all, but you might as well be there because I will read a section from chapter 2. Now, Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 indicate the kind of sacrifices that Israel was to make before God. And there's a common element in all the sacrifices that Israel was to make before Him. They were all to be <coughs> salted. They were all to have salt in them. Salt was used in the sacrifices, and it didn't, not just sin sacrifices, any kind of sacrifice. Some sacrifices in ancient Israel was for sin. The sacrifices in the sacrificial system of ancient Israel that were for sin were for sin that was not considered deliberately rebellious. There actually is no sacrifice in Israel for deliberately rebellious sin. You, you can wrestle with that yourself. But it wasn't, all the sacrifices were not only for sin. There were also fellowship offerings. There were grain offerings where they took some of the first fruits of their crops and offered them to the Lord. All kinds of offerings, not all of them for sin. But what was common in all of them was that they were all to have salt. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 13 says this. Season all your grain offerings with salt. And then he gets to the larger principle. Don't leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. And so that had become an image in the people of Israel of salting the offering. It was a way of saying the offering was sanctified, was set apart, was acceptable to God. And so Jesus tells his disciples, in the kingdom of God, you too must salt your offerings. <laughs> but they have to be salted with peace. Peace. Shalom. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The kingdom of God is not the centralization of power. The kingdom of God is not a place where we get to determine what to say and when to say it. The kingdom of God is not a place in which we'll be protected from harm or suffering or trial or tribulation. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace. Shalom. The salt of the new covenant for Jesus is peace. And Mark tells us to make no offerings without it. Now, what does shalom mean? And I'm going to read a definition. This is from a scholar named Gerard von Rad. We constrict the term shalom if we equate it strictly with peace. At root, it means well-being, with a strong emphasis on the material side. And more commonly, shalom is referred to a group. For example, a nation which enjoys prosperity is a nation at shalom, at peace. And so there is a sense here that Jesus is saying, that any offering you make in the kingdom of God must be one made from the context of shalom. Well-being. What's at stake in that? Well, I'm going to try and help because I think Jesus helps us. For instance, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's this very strange saying of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, if you are making an offering at the altar and you realize that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there at the altar and go and make peace, shalom, with your brother or your sister. And then return and make your offering. It's the same image we have here in Mark. That an offering to be acceptable to God must be made from shalom. And if you know that there's something within your control that is out of shalom in your life, you must not make an offering to God until you have sought shalom. Jesus says that in Matthew. 
But here is how this ties to that opening conversation on fear and how it ties into what the disciples are trying to accomplish with all the stuff of shutting people down who say things that they haven't authorized, of disbelieving Jesus claims that he's going to die, of wanting to figure out who's the greatest. It's fear at the root of that. And in the scriptures, fear and shalom cannot coexist. And fear, we see it already in the disciples, fear drives us to want to increase our security. And the disciples are doing the same thing. When they're told Jesus is going to be gone and the risk to them is going to be greater, they start to try and build up the walls of security. Let's centralize power, let's pick a leader, let's, let's start to figure out who's a heretic out here. Fear. Fear legitimizes the accumulation of power and the increasing of security. Fear also can legitimize deliberate disobedience to God. This is why I think Jesus brings up the suffering thing. Guys, don't be deceived. I'm not going to protect you from suffering. Because if we think God does want us to be protected from suffering, we can justify a whole lot of sin to protect ourselves from suffering and call it God's will. This also ties in in the Sermon on the Mount again in Matthew to Jesus teaching about don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of itself, right? Don't be anxious. Now that doesn't mean that we can't worry. I mean, not in the context. We can't control whether we worry. But what we can do, and this is the context of Matthew 6, is consider whether or not we're using our worry to justify disobedience. And this is the point for Jesus, because right before that passage, he talked about wealth and its deceptiveness and the security that is apparently there, which Jesus says is actually not there. And then he moves into saying, don't worry. And the point here is, don't worry so much about your safety that you use your well-being as an excuse to disobey me. Following Jesus will cause problems for us. If we think it shouldn't, we will justify sin to keep ourselves safe. Fear can legitimize the accumulation of power and the building of walls of security. Fear can legitimize disobedience to God out of a desire to be safe. But the kingdom of God is one that is not motivated by fear. It's one lived out of shalom, well-being. What is of God comes from shalom and evidences itself in love. John gets this. He gets what Jesus is eventually aiming at so well that in the epistle that he wrote later, the epistle of 1 John, he has completely changed his tune. And he wrote these words in 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, with suffering. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The kingdom of God is lived out of the sense of well-being that comes to us because of God's love for us. And it expresses itself in love for our enemies, our persecutors, our neighbors, our friends, our family. Have we allowed our faith in God to allow us to live out of shalom and not out of fear? What is shalom? Well, it certainly is the seeking of peace when people are at odds with one another. There's certainly part of the conversation. But notice the passage and what Jesus is doing. You see, Jesus removes from the disciples' expectation all the things that they would be most apt to 
to fear. He doesn't let them have all the power. Do you know how stressful and fearful it is to have all the power? If God had centralized all the responsibility to decide who did ministry where and when on these 12 guys, they would have been afraid all the time. They would have been policing every person who went out with the gospel anywhere in the Roman world all the time. Can you imagine it? You don't have to. It's in history now, once the power was centralized in the church. You can read the history in Europe and what we did to defend our power and to control it. Fear. The second thing that they're nervous about is that they won't be taken care of. And God says, don't worry, I'll bless folks who take care of you, even by just giving you a cold cup of water, I will bless them. So there's a measure of protection. They have a little incentive to take care of you. But, if you dare change my story, I will come after you. They don't have that authority. So it's not their responsibility for the message either just to teach it. And then, fear of suffering. That could be a big thing. But Jesus says, oh, don't worry. You're going to suffer till I come back. They're going to persecute you till I come back. You're not responsible to stay safe. And then he says, this is peace. To know that you don't have to protect yourself, that you don't have to Decide what you're going to say. That you don't have to, maybe how you say it, but not what you got to say. That you don't have to centralize power and be responsible for the woes of the world. So you can live out of trust. That God is on the throne. That He's given you what He wants. And you must be faithful. And if you want to ask if a, if a decision or a behavior is godly, you need to ask only one thing. Is it salted with peace? Is it salted with shalom? We must hold on to peace. Even if the worst happens in this place, even if you and I don't have a day of blessing, even if we suffer every day, for as long as we draw breath in this place, we need not fear because we believe in a God who will raise us from the dead. Amen. Who will make all things new. A God who has a vision and a plan for a new heaven and a new earth. And you and I will get there if we persevere in our faith. It's not a question of if. God is on the throne. The gates of hell cannot stand against the gospel. We don't need to attack or defend, be hostile or angry. We don't need to pick up stones or spears or swords. We need to attack the way Jesus did. By standing for the truth, being honest, and still being kind. By sitting with tax collectors and sinners, and telling stories of the truthfulness of God in their midst. Let's be a people who every offering we make to God is salted with shalom.